So before I get into all of the questions I want to ask you, I'm going to go through my quick fire questions I ask all of my guests. Just say the first thing that comes to your mind when I ask you, don't think too much about it. Question number one, what's one thing that sets your soul on fire? Transformation. What kind of transformation? Um, all kinds of transformation. I love watching anything transform. I love watching people transform healing, um, trauma into healing. I love the seasons transforming leaves into bare trees. I love yes. <laughs> all transformation. Yes. I love. Beautiful answer. Okay. The next question. What's the last photo you took? Oh, um, <laughs> a self. You know? <laughs> uh, maybe Halloween. Okay. I took a picture of my Halloween costume. Okay, I think. what did you go as? I have to ask. Um, and originally, it was supposed to be like the angel of death, and then it sort of looked morphed into like a vampire Cruella. <laughs> Sexy. Okay, I love it. Okay, next question. What's something that people frequently misunderstand or get wrong about you? So people who don't know you. Uh, they think that I am like... That like my life is super like glamorous. Okay. Um, yeah. And they think that the things that they see me doing are super glamorous. And I don't think they realize how hard it, they actually are. Mm -hmm. Would you say that is um, some kind of online perspective? I think it's just that what, it sounds different than what it is when you live it. Okay. You know, like, so for example, I've been traveling for the last uh, nine months, uh, mm -hmm. since April and I've been all over the world and it's, and it sounds really glamorous. Um, and until you're like, no, like I gave away all my things and I live out of a suitcase and I haven't had a home in nine months Okay, <laughs> and I don't have an address. Right. And then okay. people are like, oh yeah, that's different. I think than what I thought it was. Okay. Got you. Okay. So it's like a completely yeah. different perspective of your life. Okay. Yeah. Uh, finish this sentence. I'm still a work in progress when it comes to Ooh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> Any anything in particular? Anything at all? Uh, surrender, I think, is the one. You know, like I can get. Yeah, every day I'm like, all right, I trust that life is happening exactly as it's supposed to. And then I have a moment where I'm like, nope, give me back the steering wheel. I'll drive myself. <laughs> okay, yes. I and then I have to, yeah. I totally get you with that one. It's something I'm working on is my perfectionism. And I feel like that's mm. similar in the way that it's, you can't yes. go the steering wheel. Steering wheel. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, so those are the quick fire questions over. Awesome. I'm so <laughs> excited to interview you today. And something that I think you do really well is truth telling with your work. And mm -hmm. your book, The Body Is Not An Apology, the title is so incredible. It's, it's so potent and it's so powerful. Can you please tell us a bit about the amazing story behind where you came to the title, The Body Is Not An Apology? Um, yeah, I, t I talk about it a little bit in the prologue of the book, mm -hmm. but I was having a conversation with a friend and my friend was disclosing um, that they were afraid that they might have an unintended pregnancy. Um, and I've always described myself as the nosy friend. <laughs> like I will get in your business from a deep place of love. Yeah. And so um, I began asking my friend about some of the sexual health choices that she was making. Part of that is because I used to be a sexual health educator as well. I asked her why she wasn't having protected sex. And she shared my friend um, had a dis disability. She has cerebral palsy. And she shared that because of her disability, it, you know, it already made being sexual difficult and challenging. And so she just didn't feel entitled to add another request inside of the scenario. And so she said, I just didn't really feel like entitled to ask about condoms. And I said to her very instinctually, your body is not an apology. It's not something you give to someone to say, like, sorry mm -hmm. for my disability. And, um, and when I said it, it just, it resonated so clearly in me yeah. as a truth, as a truth, um, as a truth I needed to understand for myself. And so I was like, oh, that's really poetic. And at the yeah, time I so was a poet. Beautiful. <laughs> so beautiful. Yeah. I was like, oh, I'm going to write that. That feels like a poem. Yeah. And so I started writing the poem, The Body Is Not An Apology. And I think the words were so potent that they continued to make things for uh -huh. the next decade and a half. <laughs> Yeah, you you said that any time you would go to uh, examine yourself or, or look at yourself in the mirror or you felt some kind of insecurity, you had that almost at your it hand. It show up in my brain. Yeah, my yeah. body is not an apology. 
I think it's so amazing. Instantly. And also the thing is, what, what I find interesting is how we're so, we tell other people the words that we need to hear. And it's like, it yes. comes it comes in this kind of format um, when often we can't take it ourselves. It's like we give it to other people. So sometimes when I need to think about what I need to listen to, sometimes I listen to the advice that I give to my friends. I'm like, oh, that's pretty mm-hmm. good, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think most of the work that comes through me has been, it comes to other people, but it's always for me. Mm. It's always for me. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that's so amazing. And the concepts that you talk about in the book as well, radical self-love. Um, again, it's, it's something I feel like I've heard on social media and didn't really understand until your book and your work. Can you talk about radical self-love and what that means to you and why not just self-acceptance or self-love, these times that we also see around social media? Why are they not enough for us? Yeah, so I sort of conceptualize radical self-love as the experience of our inherent enoughness. It is that we know that we are enough, that we are worthy, that we are inherently divine, and that there's not anything we have to do to earn that. There's not anything we have to do to achieve it. We don't have to figure out how to be good enough, how to be worthy, and that we arrived here enough, that we we were embodied with enoughness when we showed up on the planet as babies. And what has happened is not that we've become less enough, but that we started to believe all of these messages that have told us that we are not enough in all of these different ways and categories. Mm. And so the work is not to figure out how do I become enough, which is how do I return to radical self-love, but more so how do I remove everything that is in between me and my enoughness, Mm -hmm. what everything that's in between me and my radical self-love. And, you know, I talk about radical self-love very specifically because I think um, a couple of things. One, the word radical really operationalizes what it is that I'm talking about, which is something that is foundational, that is at the very root of who we are, something that is that promotes transformation and radical change, something that impacts our political, economic, and social realities, um, and something that speaks to the, the origin of our being. And all of those are the definitions of radical. So that's the kind of love that I'm talking about when I'm talking about radical self-love. And I think that self-acceptance and self-esteem and self-confidence and these sort of other terms that people use, I'm never proposing that they're not useful. I am proposing that they're not transformational, that they don't inherently change the systems and structures that have influenced how it is that we experience ourselves and our bodies and our identities and in our lives. That I could feel good about myself today, my self-esteem is good, and not one social inequity will fall because I felt good about myself today. Mm, yes. But radical self-love, which says wait a minute, everything that has told me that I am not enough, that I am not worthy is a lie. Then that has me interrogate an entire world of messages. It has me interrogate what are the financial systems that have told me I'm not enough? What are the social systems that have told me that I'm not enough? What are the media messages that have told me I'm not enough? Then all of a sudden I am now activated toward dismantling those things in the world that are in between me and my radical self-love. Self-acceptance and self-esteem as very individualized notions don't do that work. Mm. And that's the work I'm interested in. Yeah, I I love your explanation of it. Where does not enoughness come from? We have built systems over time that somewhere in history, we did get disconnected Right. And I think that some of those things happened over time. We got disconnected because we got disconnected from the natural world. Mm -hmm. Right. We got disconnected from, oh, I have a direct relationship to what grows out of the ground. I have a direct relationship to the person in the tribe beside me because we exchange and that's how we all stay alive. Right. There were there is an ancient wisdom to our relationships that we've gotten further and further away from. And instead, what we put in that place is. If I can dominate, Mm. then I have what I need. If I can control, then I have what I need. So if I can dominate the natural world and extract what I need from it, then I have enough, Mm. right? And so all of a sudden we were in gaining our enoughness through control, gaining our enoughness through how we are in relationship to other people. 
So we began to see scarcity. If I have more than them, that must mean I'm better than them, right? And so we started taking that idea and then we started applying it to bodies, right? Well, if if I have more than them, then I'm better than them, mm. but I have to justify why I should have more than them. Yeah. So now I have to tell myself a story about why I'm inherently better. Um, and when you're, than and when you're else. saying have more than them, you're talking about the hierarchy of bodies in terms exactly. of the scale, in scale of being man, being woman, being white, being thin, being disabled. Yeah. All of it, right? And more than is more, because all of, all of those categories, right? The categories of our identities, we have attached to resource, right? The reality is, if you are a man, you make more money than a woman, almost across the board globally, right? If you are a white person, you have more resource than most people of color around the world, right? There. So what we've done is we've said, here are bodies that deserve more resource. Here are bodies that deserve more access. Here are the bodies that deserve more connection, whether that's conscious or not conscious, right? And we do that about race. We do it about gender. We do it about size. We do it about ability. We do it across all kinds of sectors of human identity. And so that's that ladder of bodily hierarchy. Mm. There's a good body, a, a better body, and then there are worse bodies. And the better your body, the more resource and opportunity and access you have, the more likely you are to feel closer to enough. The mm -hmm. less your body, the less good your body, the further away from resource you are, the more likely you are, the more likely you are to feel less um, connected to enoughness. While also at the same time making sure that nobody ever feels like enough. Because if anybody actually ever felt like enough, mm. then the system couldn't keep replicating itself. Yes. And you talk you talk about the system as the ladder and anyone who participates in it, which is most people until we have some kind of awakening um, about the existence of the ladder. We're always trying to climb it, always trying to get higher up the ladder. And essentially yeah. any kind of worth that is achieved through climbing the ladder or getting up another peg is always going to be... And I think this is what you're saying in the book and in everything you've done is that it's always going to be at the expense of someone because there will always be someone below you. Absolutely. It's always going to be at the expense of someone and it's always going to be at the expense of yourself. Because again, yes. you can climb the ladder, but the ladder is endless. The ladder cannot act. There's no top to it. No. And you know, there's no top to it. This is my favorite example, right? Like Elon Musk keeps amassing money. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> Jeff, no, no. Jeff Bezos keeps amassing money. Trying to fill they the have, void. Right. They yeah. have beat capitalism, right? Like whatever yeah. prize you would get for winning in capitalism, they certainly could have won that prize. But there is no such thing as enough to them mm. because there is no enough on that external ladder. Enoughness is, can only be felt as an internal experience. And so when you're trying to get it from the outside, you'll never actually feel it. So what are some ways that we can, as you describe, divest from the ladder altogether? Because it keeps reinforcing its existence the more we try to climb it. Yeah. So I think the first, you know, I talk about in the book, this framework of thinking, doing, being. And what I propose is that first we have to recognize we're on the ladder. We have to notice that that's what's happening. Oh, so, you know, and I think there are a multitude of tools that help us do that mindfulness and meditation are an excellent tool because okay. they bring you to the moment. Yeah. They bring you to like what's present right now. Um, but also um, anytime you're noticing thoughts. And, and so part of this is about learning to notice your thinking rather than having it be default and noticing your thinking um, happens by starting to separate out the other noise. And so in my workbook, I talk about 10 tools to radical self-love. And what I'm talking about are the tools that help us actually, actually begin to de-indoctrinate ourselves from the ladder. And so the first tool is dump the junk. And one of it is starting to notice the messages that you receive externally about your worthiness. Where am I listening to music that tells me I'm not good enough or I don't have a right body yeah. or a right way of being? Where am I listening to television shows or media that says that? What am I scrolling past on my social media feed every day that reinforces the idea that I'm not enough, right? So once you start noticing, oh, those messages, right? And then take a break from them. 
Like intentionally don't listen to that stuff for a little bit. And then you're left with your thoughts. <laughs> where am I? Where can I notice my not enough thinking? Where can I notice my not enoughness and the ways in which I'm sort of just moving through life? You know, and I tell people to do small things like give yourself a jar. And every time you say something disparaging, put a dollar in the jar, right? And it's your little, yeah. it becomes your little self-love savings account. But it also <laughs> yeah. makes you aware, like you have a physical action that you have to do every time you notice one of those things. What you're doing is you're breaking up the default energy of it. Like it just runs on automatic. You're yes. interrupting that. So once you- Okay, like autopilot. Autopilot, exactly. Yeah, And yeah. so once you've raised it to consciousness, once you're like, oh, that's the thoughts that I'm having all the time. Great. Then the next part is to say, all right, what does that thought have me do? When I think that I restrict my eating, when I think that I go shopping, when I think that I start judging someone else, when, you know, like we start to see what's mm -hmm. the connection between those thoughts and my actual behaviors. Right. And then your work is to interrupt that. Okay, I see what I do. Now today's practice is in this area to do something different. What's the new action okay. to do today? So you're, you're changing the action that follows the thought. Absolutely. And you're changing the action that follows the thought because by interrupting the thought, you are now replacing that thought with a different thought. Well, what's the opposite? Mm. What's the opposite thought? What would be the opposite action? And so the practice of new thought, new action, new thought, new action over time is what creates new, a new way of being. Yes. Okay. No, that's amazing. And that's such a practical tip because I think so much of the time, particularly on social media, there's all this, like you said, the talk about self-acceptance and self-love. And what I love that you've said before is that you don't want to just be accepted by yourself, yeah. by anyone else. You want to be loved in a way that is radical, that goes to the root of everything because we can't talk about the fact that we don't like ourselves or the fact that we're unhappy or that we're even on this treadmill of servitude to... Uh, grind culture, diet culture, whatever kind of mm -hmm. culture that it is, we can't address that without addressing that there is this ladder that we're all climbing exactly. that we don't even relate to. Like, it's just there. It's just there. We've all fallen into it somehow. And what I love that you spoke about, you said about um, how we, once upon a time, we weren't so self-critical of our bodies and um, we were kind of existing in communities with each other. Do you think that has any link to how it's become worse with how we've all become a little bit more independent and we're relying on each other less because of technology or anything and we're like less dependent on each other in our communities do you think there's any link for absolutely that? i mean i think individualism is a a yes. dangerous and That's um and and harmful way that we have learned to be and all, you know all of these systems are interconnected all of this is related right individualism which is the idea that like i can do it by myself i only need me all of my success is a function of my own greatness <laughs> all of that mm -hmm. is directly tied to capitalism right how much money i can amass how much resource i can amass it's all about this individual i i i i i conversation and as long as we are in a relationship where where we only see ourselves as the um arbiters of our success or our failure right mm -hmm. then we are inside of a a non-relational way of being inside an inherently relational world like Okay. There's no way the mythology that you did anything by yourself is exactly that. It's a total fiction. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. There are other human beings here that have to contribute, that have to play a part. But because we see ourselves as separate and part of the reason that we have to see ourselves as separate is because if we're in relationship with one another and we need one another, then how do I know I'm enough? Again, yeah. you know, then it goes back to like, if I need you, then how will I know if I'm enough? Right. And this is the reason why this idea of radical self-love felt so important to me is because if we can understand that we are inherently enough, if I understand that I was born enough, then I don't have to play inside of this system. I don't have to play inside of individualism. I don't have to play inside of capitalism. I don't have to play inside of racism to figure out mm -hmm. how to be enough.
Mm-hmm. I love the link that you've made between. Um, well, I don't love it. It's awful, but it's <laughs> it's. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but it's but it's it, it, it's it's uh, it's clever. Uh, the link you've made between how systems of oppression created from. Uh, low self-esteem in terms of the um, accruing all of this wealth and external stuff to to put people below you Mm -hmm. and you've linked it to right back to landowning white men Um, it's kind of similar to what Toni Morrison says about if you can only be tall because someone's on their knees you have a serious problem Um, can you talk a bit more about the link between social justice and the ladder and how loving your bodies and social justice are tied to one another because you talk about how the journey to even escaping any kind of systemic oppression and to dismantling them starts with yourself i just i think the link between them is so important and i'd love to hear you talk about it totally so you know again it's all connected it is all connected we have built systems out of our not enoughness we have built Mm. entire worlds that figure out how to externally validate whether or not we are enough. We call those worlds uh, white supremacy. We call them fat phobia. We call them homophobia and ageism and ableism. All of the things that say that body, failing body, not good body. This body, better body. This white, male, cisgendered, able, uh, you know, young, fit body, Mm. the best body, (laughs) the best body. And so we give it everything, right? Like we give it everything. (laughs) That's how great that body is, right? And then every other body, figure out where you belong on that ladder, right? Those systems are what we're talking about when we're talking about social justice. But part of what we've done is we've decided those systems are outside of us. That system is over there, right? Like that bad thing is over there as opposed to the idea that we were born into those systems, right? We came here full of radical self-love little infants who loved ourselves, (laughs) just gurgling and happy. And then somebody (laughs) said, you're a boy, you're a girl. You're a boy, that's better. If you're not a boy, Mm. not as great. But if you're pretty, that's better. But if you're thin, Mm. that's better. But if you're white, that's better. If you're disabled, not as good. Right. And so then we started being categorized into these various locations on that ladder. And all of those locations on that ladder correspond to a system of privileges and resources that exist in the world. Mm -hmm. When I divest individually from that system, when I divest, when when I stop believing that my fat, queer, neurodivergent, black body is inherently less than some other body. I take a rung off of that ladder. Mm. Every time I personally divest from the own, the messages that I've received about my own body, I start destabilizing the ladder. Then I, and if I divest from it for me, then I have to start realizing, well, the thing that they told me wasn't true for me, but it must not be true for that body either for the body, that other body outside of me that I was told was wrong or bad. Right. Mm -hmm. It's every time we personally de-indoctrinate ourselves from the story of wrong, bad, not good bodies, lesser bodies, we destabilize the systems of injustice and oppression that rely on us believing those things. And would you say that you destabilize the system because I think a lot of people often, when I do Q&As and stuff, people feel disempowered by the fact that they don't have a platform or that they don't have a following or whatever. And I always say to them, like, you're, you're, the knock-on effect of something that's internal is just immeasurable because you carry it with you in every single thing you do. It changes where you spend your money. Exactly. It changes who you interact with. It changes who you support. You could be in a room with someone who overhears you say something. It's the knock-on effect is immense. And so when you say that it takes a rung off the ladder, I mean, you wrote a book about it, which has liberated thousands of people. So I think that the the impact of divesting just as one person, the, the impact is immeasurable. Absolutely. And I think that it's um you don't need to make some because I think sometimes people can look at big systems and feel so helpless. Absolutely. And what I think And you don't need that platform to do no, it. No, you don't. Like here's what I I say in the book very explicitly is like it's all contagious. 
Shame yes. is contagious, yeah. right? Self-loathing is contagious. Our belief in the system, totally contagious. Radical self-love, absolutely contagious. We have all interacted with someone at some point and been like, wow, when they walk in the room, they radiate something and I want that. Yeah, We've all had that experience, yes. right? And mm-hmm. so every time we choose to embody our own radical self-love and divest from that system, we are creating a ripple effect beyond what we could ever imagine. And the story that you need hundreds of thousands of people following you on social media or you need a platform is just another way to keep you tied into <laughs> the story of your enoughness is external. Mm. Your enoughness is outside of you. It's in how many people see you. That Even that story is part of the latter. How do you feel that body positive or self-love spaces online have hindered getting to that real radical self-love? Because I feel like a lot of the time it can be performative, not just from the people who were talking about it, but from anyone who kind of engages with it. I feel like on, on a personal level, I've always felt this tension between how I actually feel in my body and then how I think I should feel for my mm-hmm. audience as someone that they look up mm-hmm. to for my body. A lot of young women listen to me. I would never trash talk my body. I would never blah, 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 blah. And I, I know all the things. I know the theory, mm-hmm. right? But then it's like in real life, I don't I don't always feel fucking incredible in my body. Um, and there's, there's, so, there's so much stuff they wouldn't even discuss online. Exactly. But there's this tension for me between those two spaces. So I was wondering if you've ever experienced that between ha- having the online world and the offline world and how... It, how body positive spaces online have contributed towards this. Yeah, totally. So, you know, I mean, I've, I've always had a critique since the word body positive arrived in, in the scene. (laughs) I've always had a critique of it. One, because it, it encourages us to feel positively about our bodies, right? Like, (laughs) Oh, you have to feel positive about your body. And I'm like, that's a, It is very difficult to feel positive about one's body when an entire tsunami of systems and ideas and individuals are telling you, no, your body is awful, right? And so it's asking Mm. the individual again to take ownership over the impact of the collective, right? And, Mm. and, And part of the reason it does that is because it's an inherently apolitical concept, right? It like, it doesn't deal with systems. It doesn't deal with structures. It's again, this idea of the individual. If I, I will just feel good about my size 14 jeans. And I'm like, that doesn't change the fact that manufacturers exploit folks in bigger bodies. It doesn't change medical malpractice of bigger bodies. It doesn't change that individual notion doesn't change anything that is created the circumstances of the reasons why we don't feel good in our bodies to begin with. And so yes. I'm interested in what we move and shift that does actually change the circumstances such that it is easier to feel better about our bodies. But the other point is, and it's the reason I talk about radical self-love rather than body positivity is because there are things that I love that get on my nerves sometimes. There are yes. things, you know, I was like, I'm thinking about parents. They love their kids and boy, they be tired of them children. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> right? And it doesn't mean they love yeah, them yeah, any yeah. less. It doesn't yes. mean they intend to care for them any less. And it doesn't, it, yeah. And it doesn't demand a constant positive it's attitude absolutely, about things. That would, and it would ex- implode the entire circuitry of a parent to have to pretend. <laughs> like, actually, it's a great way to create trauma inside of a child is to pretend all the time, like everything's just fine, right? Okay. Like, that's not healthy at all. <laughs> yeah. What is healthy is an authentic and honest relationship. An authentic mm-hmm. and honest relationship with my body. I tell people all the time, I've spent the last... 13 years running an organization focused entirely on radical self-love. And there are days that I do not feel loving toward my body, right? Yes. And on those days, the job isn't to be like, oh, I'm failing at radical self-love. The job is to be like, can I love the Sonia that doesn't love her body? Can I, I love you, Sonia, who feels like you're not enough. I love you, Sonia, mm-hmm. who feels like you're failing, who feels like you never fit in. I love that version of you. That version of you is as lovable as every other aspect of you. And the more mm-hmm. love I pour into the parts of me that feel the most unlovable, 
the more I become reconciled toward a a whole experience of love again. Yeah, because then I guess to not love that version is just to abandon yourself all over again exactly. in the name of whatever kind of idea you you, you have in your head that you're supposed to feel. The thing you body. think you're supposed to do, supposed to feel. I'm supposed to feel good. No, that's not true. It's not real. It's not realistic. And what I can do is say, I love, I love the me that, you know, there are days I tell people all the time, like when I wake up and I have to take a really early flight, those are the days when I'm the light, the least decent version of myself. I'm, <laughs> I just, I have horrible thoughts about every human on the train. Yes. I can't stand anybody. And I'm like, oh, you're really, really awful. <laughs> like, Sonia, yes. you're really awful right now. And then I say, I love you awful, Sonia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, that's so I, good. I've never even thought to do that. I love that. you, awful Sonia. Right? And the more that I love awful Sonia, the less awful she becomes. Wow. Well, again, like you said, a bit a bit like a child. Like a child. Just loving, loving the stupid thing. Loving. Love her. Like, I love you. Oh. I really, you are on my damn nerves. And I love yeah, you, child, yeah, yeah. that is on my damn nerves today. How much does um, joy play a part in your work and how important is joy to radical self-love? They are, you know, they're they're inescapable comrades, right? Like they're just Mm -hmm. bound together. (laughs) Besties. (laughs) You know, I think about joy, you know, and I've often, people talk about joy as resistance and particularly inside of... um, social justice and anti-oppression spaces, liberation spaces. Um, And I think about joy as um, inevitable if we allow it to be. Like it can't not be accessed, right? Like it literally is how one makes it to the next day is the ability to cultivate and find joy. And so I find joy, the experience of joy is like the sun, right? Like it's mm-hmm. available, it's there, it's shining. Some clouds may roll yeah. back past one day. That don't mean the sun stops shining. <laughs> it just means there's some yeah. clouds there. But the sun is still doing what it does. Joy is still there, still available, still present, still waiting for us to choose to access it, to choose mm-hmm. to lean into it. That's yeah. It's there, though. And the more that we can access it, the more the the clouds of self doubt of not worthiness, the clouds of um, deep investment in these oppressive systems, the more those clouds dissipate, and the more we're mm. in relationship between our radical love and the inherent joy that it that is created from being connected. It's the reason why kids are so joyful, right? Yeah, it's because they're they've not been told that they don't deserve they it. They are yet. so connected to their radical love that joy is an essential overflow of it. It's like the runoff. Yes. Thank you so much. We're going to move into the listener questions now. Can you give me a hand answering them? Sure, happily. Okay. Um, okay, question number one. How can radical how can radical self-love not be seen as selfish by the people around me in my life? Oh, I love people. People often ask that question and I think it's so interesting. Um, okay. And I think we have to talk about like the root of the question, which is the idea that loving oneself, again, we're inside of a comparison. If I love me, yeah. it must mean that I love you less. It must mean I'm going to care mm. for you less, right? So selfish is I care about me at the expense of you. Oh, we're back. Yes, we're, Cause that's what we used we're to We're back inside the hierarchy. We're back on the ladder. Yes. Right? And yes. love is infinite. Guess what? Y'all love is infinite. It is uncontainable. <laughs> you can't run out of it, which does not yes. mean that if I love me, it has to be at the expense of you. Right. Oh, it's that scarcity mindset again that we're just so encouraged to have. There's only this much love. And so if I'm loving me, then that means I have to give you less love. (laughs) Right. Yes. That that is inside of the lab. That is ladder thinking. Right. And (laughs) and radical love thinking says the more that I cultivate love inside of myself, the more love, the more authentic, connected love I have to give to others. I tell people all the time, if I had a cup of water, right? Mm -hmm. And my cup of water was like just down here and it was mostly just my backwash, 
right? Yeah. I'm not generous because I gave you the dredges of my backwash, <laughs> right? Yes. That's not that's not care, right? That's 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 something else. Usually, it's me mm. trying to figure out my self worth through how much I can extend myself, how much I can diminish myself for you. That's usually what that is, right? But yeah. if I am overflowing and I give you my overflow, right? Mm. You're always one going to get fresh water, right? And I'm never going to have to do without. We both are yes. met in that scenario. So mm-hmm. I get... It's abundance. It's abundance, right? And so radical yeah. self-love is I want to be so abundant in my love that it pours from me fully into everything else it is that I engage with. Yes. I think I saw someone describe it once. I think it was Lisa Nichols. She described it as um, like a, a teacup and a saucer and feeding people from your saucer. Exactly. So so, so that the, the stuff that's overpouring because you are so abundant. Exactly. And again, I just, it all comes back to the ladder and I'm amazed every time, <laughs> even though you've said, even though you've said it multiple <laughs> times, it all comes back. I'm still blown away by how, I, I, I just think it's so amazing because it's, it's so simple and that's why it's so complex. Um, yeah, I, I think that's amazing. Okay, thank you so much for that answer. So the next question, where does the line, so someone's asked, where does the line between self-love and narcissism go? How far can you go in self-love? Yeah, I mean, I think that, and I, I'm always fascinated by this, this conflation of things that are just actually not related at all, right? And I think that's because, again, hmm. we have, we have, warped the definition of love. We've just made it mean a bunch of things. We've, we have tried to fit it into the ladder. And so now we relate to love from the perspective of the ladder, right? Because narcissism yeah. is not a love. Narcissism from its clinical yeah. definition is someone who feels a deep sense of not enoughness. And so they have an overinflation, a vibrato, a pretend a pretend yes. elevation of themselves to try to feel the not enoughness. It is, doesn't come from love. Narcissism no, is not a function of loving <laughs> yourself. It's a function of a deep sense of disconnection and a lack of love. And so consequently, mm. it again has to barter for love through the, with the external world by pretending I'm so great, I'm so wonderful, I'm so amazing. And I say that so that the outside world will tell me that too. Yeah. It doesn't come from a belief in one's love. Would you would you would you say that so if narcissism is inherently hollow and and needs to accrue mm-hmm. things outside of it to make up the facade that it is l- loving itself and that it is um that it isn't hollow and that it is full. Mm-hmm. Would you say that typically people who actually love themselves it's a little more quiet or just a little less grandiose than Well yeah, that it kind isn't performative. It doesn't require yes. a performance. Right. It just is. It just is. Right. Yeah. That's the difference. <laughs> yeah. Like that's the difference. With, like I said, that thinking doing creates being right. You just are. You don't have to try. It's a, that's why I tell people like you don't have to try yeah. to figure out how to love yourself. Love is your inherent state and everything else is what needs to be removed, peeled away so that your inherent state just is. Right. Mm -hmm. Anything where you find yourself in performance isn't love. Right. It is it is vying. It's the latter. It is. How can I externally climb to gather my worthiness, to gather my enoughness, to gather my lovability? Right. That's not love. It's just it just is. Oh my God, I'm just going to give you Sonia's Instagram straight away because you all need to be following her. Um, I'm sure you're all in love with her after everything she had to say. I had to stop so many times during that and write notes. Her Instagram is at Sonia Renee Taylor. So that's S-O-N-Y-A-R-E-N-E-E-T-A-Y-L-O-R. It's going to be in the description of the podcast anyway. And you can buy her book, The Body Is Not An Apology, if you want to hear more from her. 